Hello, hello, hello. Um, I am super, super, super excited to be here with y'all tonight. And I already see some wonderful comments in the chat. So thank y'all for, for being on here and I'm excited to, to chat and answer all sorts of different questions um, that pertain to, to OCD and faith and advocacy and life and, and beyond. So um, really, really, really excited just to get to chat. Um, so a couple different things before we get into um, all of our content for tonight and all of our questions. Um, I just want to know one of the reasons I wanted to do a stream with no CD this week is it's a big week coming up. Um, so it is my birthday tomorrow, which is a, a big, um, always, always a fun thing. But really, the, the big one is um, that this coming Saturday is my next 50 ultras in 50 states for OCD race. So for folks who might follow me on Instagram or follow my story, um, I'm racing 50 ultra marathons in 50 states to fundraise for one individual in each state seeking OCD treatment. The next race in South Carolina is this coming Saturday. So if that is something that you would like to follow along with or support, feel free to head to my Instagram at Rev K Runs Beyond OCD um, and would love to um, have your support, but also just have you follow and send good vibes. Um, I don't know what Saturday will bring. It might be um, folks cheering. It also might be um, a really tough day. So who knows? Kind of like kind of like OCD with all of these different different aspects that we that we face on an important um an important day, right? Where sometimes all those feelings and emotions come up. So I'm going to dive into questions in, in just a second. But before I do that, um, I'm going to introduce myself a little bit for folks on here that I might not know. Um, I am Katie. I'm an ordained minister. I also have OCD. And I'm very public about being a member of the clergy who navigates OCD, particularly who has navigated taboo themes related to harm and related to sexuality and related to all sorts of different things that were really, really tough for me and that felt really stigmatizing as a minister um, as I wondered, well, how could I possibly have this identity, right, but still have these intrusive thoughts? And what I want folks to know is that the things that our OCD latches onto are really those things that are the most significant to us. It is not a reflection of your character. And yet you can still um, continue to, to lean into that uncertainty, to sit with that discomfort as you move towards your values. And that's some of what we're going to talk about here tonight. Um, so I have the pleasure now of shifting into work full time around OCD and faith with um, my practice, Faith and Mental Health Integrative Services. I'm like half and half right now because I'm still working in school chaplaincy, but um, we'll be doing this work full time starting um, June 1st, which is crazy and exciting. Um, and I wouldn't be in this space in my life getting to do work around OCD and faith full time if it wasn't for all of you, um, because um, <laughs> I've been where a lot of folks are. And um, I know that so many of us have journeyed together. And it's just really an honor to be on this journey with so many amazing members of this community. So um, that's a really quick rundown of a little bit about who I am from running to um, to ministry to OCD and all the things. Um, and I'm also an advocate for the IOCDF, a lead advocate there. So lots of, lots of random things, but happy to get more into my story um, as I answer questions tonight. So um, let me start to, to dive in. In so I can um, hit on as many things as humanly possible. Oh, this is such a great question that I don't know if I know the answer to. So thank you, Jordan. Hi, Katie. Thanks for everything you do. I'm grateful for you, Ethan, and no CD as a whole. What's your favorite OCD quote that's gotten you through tough times? Um, oh, okay. There's a lot that I like um, and a lot that I... Um, gosh, reflect on on Instagram every day. So a lot of the big quotes I have, honestly, um, Ethan kind of picks on me for, for folks who don't know Ethan, he's an IOCDF advocate too. He's also my partner and my significant other and um, kind of my other half. And he um, he kind of jokes because he says half the stuff I post on Instagram is just stuff that he said, um, which is sort of true because he really has inspired me in advocacy. But one of the big things he says is um, about being willing for all of the scary stuff to come true in order to have a chance at that life that you want and that you deserve. Um, and that for me has been one of the most profound, impactful things. Um, and that really is where my recovery shift came when I was willing to let or to risk all of that bad, scary, icky stuff coming true 
for even a shot at that life that I, I wanted and that I desired and that I deserved. Um, and I, I think another component with this, another favorite OCD quote, I feel like I'm not going to say it all that perfectly, <laughs> but relates to um, there really only being one thing that's certain. And that's that if you continue to do what you've been doing, if you continue to get, engage in compulsions, you'll get sicker, right? It's the only thing that's certain. The thing that's uncertain is actually really, really exciting, right? You could take this leap. You could take this chance and have a shot at this big, beautiful, awesome life. And, and those are kind of two pieces that really stick with me. So thank you for, for asking. Nicole, thank you. Thank you for the Instagram um, comment. I really appreciate that. Um, so do you think OCD can um, be episodic and have flare ups? Um, hmm. Some weeks get so bad with my intrusive thoughts, um, images, urges, and I'm back at square one. Um, yeah, so absolutely. I was trying to think about how best to answer this because I'm definitely somebody who believes, um, at least in my own journey, that OCD is OCD and we have OCD throughout our life, but you can move into these beautiful periods of recovery or a full period of recovery. And that's that's where I am. I think that the reason um, that I'm able to enjoy my life the way that I am and to feel present is because I recognize that I have OCD and that these these thoughts might pop up and things might get sticky and I can say, oh, OCD, that's you doing your thing and I'm going to respond in a particular way. Um, and yet I do think we can have flare ups. Um, I think that for me, the intrusive thoughts are always there, not, not just because I have OCD, but because everybody has weird intrusive thoughts all the time. We just tend to notice them more with OCD. But the big flare-ups for me tend to come um, in times of grief, in times of trauma, or in times of stress. Um, and I, I'm pretty open about the fact that one of my big, really my big relapse that got me into advocacy was in... Um, in 2018 to 2019, when I was experiencing a profound period of grief and loss. And this led to a big flare up that I didn't necessarily know how to handle at the time. What I will tell you is that every single time, um, it feels like we're back at square one and we're not. That's just kind of an OCD trick. You are definitely never back at square one because every time you go through an episode, right? Every time um, you go through some sort of flare up, you have learned from all of these previous experiences. And OCD will always tell you you're back at square one, but you have all of these skills and tools from all of the other things that you've navigated with OCD. So you're never starting again. You're continuing to move forward. You're continuing to learn. Um, I always, also always like to say that a lapse is different from a relapse. We have an opportunity when we hit that kind of flare up point, when we hit that lapse, to say, okay, you know what? This is this is kind of stressful, and I may have engaged in a compulsion, but I'm going to choose to use my tools to move forward with my big, beautiful life. And I think the neat thing is recognizing that we have a choice in that every single moment, um, and you can choose yourself and your life over the OCD. Um, okay, let's see. Just wondering, how do you get past feeling like you have a thought on purpose? dealing with the theme of POCD. Yeah, so thanks for bringing this up. And I know there is so much shame for folks around POCD. So just want to note, going back to what I said a little bit earlier, um, that the themes that our OCD latches on to have to do with the things that are the most important to us. So that means that that's something significant to you. That means that's a theme and themes that you would never want to have or engage in. Um, and that can make it feel really, really hard Um when you're engaging in things like exposure and response prevention. Um, but it also might make it really hard when you're wondering, wait, did I have that thought on purpose? Did that thought come up on purpose? Um, so it, either way that you're talking about, if you're engaging in exposures, where you intentionally have to bring up those thoughts, or if you're just worried that they're coming up on purpose, both pieces can be challenging. And what I'll say is we tend to stay latched onto things that we don't want to think about. So if you've heard the pink elephant example, um, if someone says, don't think about a pink elephant, literally the thing you're going to be thinking about is a pink elephant, right? And I think the same thing happens with POCD or with any of our themes. When we sit here and we say, don't think about POCD, don't think about POCD, don't think about this intrusive thought, that's the exact thing 
you're going to think about. So I think being able to expect that you're probably going to think about it because you're latching on at this particular time is a really, really good practice. Um, but also acknowledging that it has nothing to do with you. Um, it has to do more with OCD taking your values and flipping them on their head. Okay, let's see. 802. Um, today in therapy, I talked about something I was frustrated about and didn't realize it was an OCD thing until it was pointed out. Yeah, we have totally all been there. How do we get better at pinpointing OCD stuff when it can be sneaky? Okay, I love this question because OCD is super, super, super sneaky and um, it's full of a lot of junk. I always say like OCD likes to send us very consistent junk mail in our brains, right? And um, I, I think the best thing to do um, I know you can be talking a lot of, about a lot of different things with this is one um, kind of knowing the way that your brain works, knowing the things that you tend to maybe latch on to. And that might even mean knowing a little bit about your core fear. So for me, for instance, core fear all relates to being a bad, harmful person, right? So anything that I do, if it can link back to being a bad, harmful person, um, I can have a pretty good sense that it's probably something related to OCD, even if it's something new. Um, so for instance, if I want to go check with a bunch of people at work to make sure um, something I did pastorally um, made everybody feel really good, yeah, that could seem like something that naturally someone might want to do. But for me, linking it back to that core fear and recognizing, wait, is it just because I want to make sure that I didn't upset anyone can kind of alert me to the fact that it's an OCD thing. Um, one of the practices I also like to, to do is especially um, if you're in a particularly heightened period with OCD is generally if you're asking the question, is this OCD? Um, a lot of times I'll choose to treat it as OCD. Generally, um, if something is actually a problem that you're engaging in, you'll just automatically take care of it. But if you're saying, is this OCD? It's generally a great idea to treat it as OCD. If I didn't answer your question, feel free to let me know a little bit further down or if you have some specifics. Hi, love, Lana. Love having you on all of these streams. Yes. Um, so, so Jackson, I definitely feel, feel strongly um, about this. And I don't know that I have the solutions to it, but I can tell you that I feel strongly. So um, I know that care for mental illnesses, specifically OCD, um, can be very, very costly. And that, that can be really challenging for folks to be able to engage in and navigate evidence-based treatments, right? So we talk all the time about the importance of exposure and response prevention, but what does that look like if someone can't access that in their area or if they don't have the financial means to do that? What I will say is I strongly appreciate No CD um, in the stream that you're on tonight uh, for creating some of the most affordable OCD treatment out there and really trying to expand that throughout the world. So I know that's a, a really, a really big step. Um, and No CD is doing awesome work. But Jackson, I, I feel for for families that that's still a struggle. And it's it's one of the reasons for me that this 50 ultras in 50 states piece is really significant of, um, I know that it's one person in each state, well, actually with no CDs, awesome match, it's two folks in each state, but just, I think every little bit of trying to make sure that everyone can access this, this life-saving treatment is so incredibly crucial because everyone deserves that, right? Everyone deserves to have a chance at this big, beautiful, awesome life. Um, so I think that this is something that we need to continue to work on as a wider community, right? But um, I appreciate the work of No CD. I appreciate the work that so many here, I've seen a lot of names on here who are doing work in this area, and I appreciate that and glad to be on the journey together to making treatment more accessible and affordable. Okay, let's see. So this is an interesting question. Um, how many times during the day do you have intrusive thoughts? I feel like I have them all the time. So um, I would say I probably have them all day long. I just don't notice them at the point that I am in my recovery. And the reason I say that is I think we just have thoughts, thousands and thousands and thousands of thoughts all day long um, that we kind of name intrusive, right? That we feel are, are really intrusive for us. I would say most of the population has kind of weird, creepy, intrusive thoughts. And I'm not minimizing what folks with OCD experience. We notice the thoughts in ways that others might not because we latch onto them. Um, but I always joke, you know, if 
really all of the thoughts that kind of weird us out. Um, pretty much the general population has those thoughts. They just aren't noticing them in the same way. So I would say when I was at my height of OCD, I felt like I was noticing those intrusive thoughts literally all the time, just like you said, all the time, constantly, 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 constantly. But now, um, gosh, I, I don't notice them that frequently throughout the day. Or when I do, I'm able to dismiss them really quickly. I'm able to name it as a thought and move on. So one of those things that I think is a really great tool is, is being able to separate yourself from the thought um, and say something like, well, I notice I'm having the thought that I'm a horrible person, or I notice I'm having the thought that I could have hit someone with my car, right? And separating yourself from it and recognizing that a thought is just a thought is just a thought. And for me, that was a really great tool in separating myself and then starting to notice those thoughts or pay attention to them even less. Okay, let's see. How do you balance what's important to confess or not? Um, so, yeah, that's that's a that's a great piece. Um, and feel free further down in the chat if you have more to add with this. Um, I would say confession, if it's related to OCD in any way, shape, or form, is probably not the direction you want to go because that becomes incredibly, incredibly compulsive. Um, if we're confessing something, it's most likely because um, we're trying to alleviate some aspect of our OCD. Now, I know there is an aspect of confession in particular faith traditions, um, including Catholicism. Um, so I don't know if you're asking in that area. Um, I definitely think this, this is actually some of the work I do with clients of parsing out what's faith and OCD. OCD, right? What's a part of your faith practice as opposed to what's OCD? Um, but even if that's a part of your faith tradition, if that becomes something repetitive, if that becomes a way of alleviating anxiety or alleviating a sense of fear or guilt or shame, um, that confession piece is, is not going to be helpful for you. So general rule, confession and OCD are not a good mix. Um, I know, again, with some faith traditions, there's a part of that. And that's really work you need to do um, to be able to separate, well, where's the faith from where's the OCD to not fall into that consistent trap of reassurance seeking and confession. Um, thank you for all the folks saying happy early birthday in the chat. I appreciate that. Um, yeah, so I just want to offer some compassion to to this this comment here. I have OCD all the time. Even writing this message is so hard. Um, and I want to note, as somebody with OCD, and I I know even having OCD, I know it feels different when you're hearing from somebody who's in recovery or who's on a live stream. And I just want to note that I remember um, even in 2019, so not all that long ago sitting and watching live streams and feeling like my OCD was different, feeling like I was the only one that wasn't going to get better, feeling like I was actually this horrific person that my OCD was telling me that I was, um, and feeling like I deserved absolutely nothing. And I would look at the people um, on live streams. I would look at the people at conferences and I would say, that will never be me. Theirs is different from mine um, or I am different, right? And I'm really, really happy to say that while I was in that place and while, while it was so hard to even put messages in the chat and just terrifying, absolutely terrifying, um, treatment saved my life. And I strongly believe that everybody has that opportunity, that everybody has um, that chance to reclaim that beautiful life. So Sangeeta, I just, I just want you to hear that, that I know writing this message and just being here is so hard right now. Um, but I really do believe that you can reclaim your life, right? And you can be um, in a space where you're you're sharing with others how they might be able to reclaim their lives too. Um, and I think we have an opportunity to reclaim that life, but also to create beauty out of brokenness as we move forward and try to make a difference for others. So thank you for your willingness to share. Um, yeah, thank you for all the, the sweet words. Yeah, Stephanie, thank you so much. Um, I really... The, for folks commenting on on the Instagram piece, that's been kind of new for me and kind of uncomfortable. Um, I just started advocating really with the IOCDF like a year ago. And the Instagram piece for me was, yeah, very new. I kind of didn't know what advocacy in that way meant. Um, and especially for me, I've been in a public role as a long time for a long time in ministry. And I always really feared what are people going to think of me if I put kind of my mental health components out there? Um, and it's really through some of that advocacy that 
I've wanted to make the shift into full-time work around OCD, partially because of so many awesome humans like you um, and getting to engage in this work. So thank you also all for being vulnerable and for reaching out and sharing things with me. Um, let's see. Yeah, so I, I want to note this, and this isn't um, an area that I navigate all that much with folks, so I'll say this isn't um, personally an area or, or with, with clients. It's an area that I do a whole lot of work with, but hyper-awareness of really any bodily function I know can be really, really challenging for folks with, with OCD. Um, I think the closest thing I experienced to this, I used to really struggle with um, noticing my breathing when I was younger, and um, I would really get in this space of, okay, if I'm not focusing on it, am I going to stop breathing? And what does this look like? But the hyper awareness of swallowing, actually even reading this, I can kind of, I can feel that sense. And I know that's so, so, so challenging and the social anxiety that brings up. Um, I think that the really kind of neat thing is exposure and response prevention um, really fits with this component too, right? Um, and being able to engage with a clinician that's that's licensed like through NoCD um, or another space where individuals are able to, um, you know, live into and lean into that fear can be really important even with this. So um, I know um, that that might mean you are kind of exposing yourself to the fact that um, folks are noticing um, the way that you are swallowing or that they're noticing this or noticing that and continuing to engage in a way that's meaningful. Um, there's a lot of work with the social anxiety piece with that exposure that can be done of being able to say, yep, they might be noticing the swallowing that I'm doing, but I'm going to continue to move forward. Um, so I think there are exposures in that area, both around social anxiety, but also around um, the hyper awareness that can be done. And I would just encourage you to engage in a professional. Again, not my big expertise area, but I do want to let you know that there are there is hope in that area. Okay. Um, let's see. I'm going to scroll down and see if there is... Um, some different stuff because I know I'm only at like 806. Y'all have awesome questions here. So what was the most helpful ERP tool that changed your OCD journey? Um, whew, this is this is a, a great question. Um, hmm. In some ways, it goes back to what I was saying at the very beginning about favorite quotes. I think there's, um, for me, this element of being willing to have all of the bad, scary stuff come true for a chance at the life that I want and desire and deserve. Um, and I think the for a long time, the piece that prevented me from getting over that hump had to do with feeling like it was totally irresponsible to say that, right? A lot of my, my stuff related to harm, it related to care for other people. And it was like, well, how could I possibly risk the safety of all of these people I care about? Like that would just be totally irresponsible. But beginning to recognize and accept my diagnosis while also leaning in and saying, you know what, <laughs> I'm going to make a much bigger difference in the world if I'm able to reclaim this person I know I can be. I'm going to risk all of this stuff. I, I think for me also realizing that risking it didn't mean saying that it was definitely going to come true. And maybe that's a different component too. Um, I, I did a post on this actually last week that saying, hey, I'm living into the uncertainty. It can still mean um, saying, you know what, it's probably OCD, but I'm going to choose to live into this uncertainty anyway. It's not saying the bad thing is definitely going to happen. It's actually accepting uncertainty while still having radical faith in the face of the unknown. And I think that was a good component for me that then helped me to say, yeah, I have radical faith. I'm going to risk that this could happen, but I'm going to have radical faith that this is what I need to do to reclaim my life. Um, I also think for me, a self-compassion component was really significant too, um, for the first time of realizing that I could want to get better for myself, right? And that I actually deserve to get better. That was a big component also linked to acceptance and commitment therapy and linked to values and linked to reasons for me to get better. Alicia, this is such a great piece. So we're actually doing, um, in May, an IOCDF town hall, um, all on this topic on false memory, as well as real event OCD. So for folks who are watching who might not be aware what these are, 
Um, false memory OCD has to do with kind of an imagined event where it starts off with a worry of, well, what if I did something bad? What if I did something um, that wasn't appropriate? What if I did something harmful? And a lot of times it starts by trying to check that you didn't do something negative, right? And um, what happens with that is sometimes we'll try to bring an imagined image into awareness to prove that we didn't do it. So um, for instance, if you're worried you caused harm in the middle of a crowded club, you might bring the vision of you causing harm into your mind. Well, so here's what ends up happening. You bring that image up that didn't exist to begin with. You say, well, what if it happened? And then since you've brought it into awareness, you start to wonder, wait, was that just because I was bringing it up or was that actually a memory? Am I sure that wasn't a memory? And this is for a lot of folks kind of how it starts. Um, a lot of times we hear about false memory being around um, alcohol. For, for me, it never was. For me, it was just normal daily life kind of stuff where I would have a wonder of what if this is my fault or especially in light of trauma, what if this bad thing that happened in the world or to someone I care about was my fault? And I would start to ask questions. And um, when I couldn't answer those questions for sure, it, which we never can, by the way, um, as far as most people's standards, I actually was answering those questions for sure that none of those things were my fault. But as far as OCD standards, where you can't prove without a shadow of a doubt, which nobody can, um, I started very much to buy into and live into the idea that the things I was afraid of were true. And they start to feel like memories while they're not. Okay. Real event OCD is typically about stuff that actually has taken place. Usually those are, are kind of more minor things where we look back when we were a kid or even a few months ago and say, oof, I did that thing and I'm not super proud of it. But you're continuing to harp on that in a way that you are making it out to be a much bigger moral quandary than it maybe it actually is. Okay. So for both of these, whether it's false memory or real event OCD, exposure and response prevention all the way, right? Um, so that might be imaginal exposure around false memory OCD, imagining that that real event came true and saying this may or may not be true and I may or may not have to live with these consequences. And for real event OCD, particularly for folks where it relates to moral scrupulosity, which it often does, it's, it's about saying, yeah, I may or may not be bad because of this thing that I did. And it may or may not have these horrible outcomes. I am willing to sit with all of this uncertainty. Generally, with both of these, um, folks say, how could I possibly accept uncertainty in the real event category about something that actually happened? Or in the false memory category, um, a lot of times it's about a crime or something like that. How could I possibly accept uncertainty about, you know, um, something that I feel like I need to confess or something that caused harm? But both of those, I promise you, it is possible to accept uncertainty about it. With false memory OCD, again, it's having radical faith and having trust that, yeah, probably my OCD, but I'm willing to accept uncertainty no matter what OCD says. And with real event OCD, it's still, again, sitting with that component of, you know what, who knows what it means about me, but I trust the person that I am. I have radical faith. I can sit with all of this and move forward in a way that's meaningful. Both of these have been big components in my life, both I thought I would never get out of, and for both exposure and response prevention that I didn't think would work, helped me reclaim my life. So Alicia, again, we have this town hall on that next month with the IOCDF, but I know NoCD has awesome false memory and real event OCD resources too, a lot of which I looked to when I was really struggling. Okay, yeah, lots of folks talking about flare-ups too. Um, and this is actually, so let me just continue the false memory component. How come OCD makes me believe my false memories? Yeah, I have totally, totally been there. Um, you know, for, I shared kind of my longer story at the IOCDF conference last year and how I got so far down in a particular false memory um, that I would come home from working as a school chaplain during the day, literally helping kids deal with trauma. Um, all day and then would come home and stare at the phone and try not to call the police on myself because I was worried that I was responsible for a crime that I didn't commit. That's how deep I got into false memories where I had imagined places and all sorts of things that didn't actually take place. Um, and it can feel very believable. And I think for me, there is always this this glimmer of, OK, I know this is probably OCD, but what if it's not? Right. But what if it's not? And every time we continue to live into that, what if it's not, 
it feels more real. Every time we continue to try to prove that it's not, we're like solidifying or changing that quote unquote memory that's not a memory even more. Um, so for me, this thing that started as a what if became a full blown kind of image and story in my mind. And I just want you to hear from me, they do feel real. It feels incredibly, incredibly real. But trust your diagnosis, trust this journey, and trust that this treatment is worth it for you to get back that life you desire and deserve. And you do deserve to overcome this and get better. Um, and I, I'm living proof you can, because especially with false memory, I never thought I would. Um, and, and I'm here and I, I'm telling my story and it's hard, but take that leap, Catherine, because you deserve it. Um, let's see. I'm going to see if I can, we have a lot of ERP questions here. Wow. I'm still only at 810. So I'm going to scroll down and see if there's any that just jump out at me here. Um, yeah. Okay. So, so this one's, this one's kind of a broader question. I like this. So I feel like I'm obsessing over something literally 24 seven. How do you handle changing the way you respond to something you feel is always on your mind? So I love that the fact that you asked about how we change the way that we respond. And I think this has been a really big component for me. Um, so the clients I work with around faith and OCD um, actually might hate this tool, but this is my favorite tool to use with them. I love the idea of, of actually, as something pops up, right, um, actually acting excited about it, actually acting like it's an opportunity for you to fight your OCD. So, for example, so Stephanie, say you get an intrusive thought. Um, you might actually, I always tell my clients, like, you might jump out of your chair, right? And you might say, yes, this is awesome. I have an intrusive thought. What an awesome chance to fight my OCD. I know that sounds totally ridiculous and you might not really be excited. You can even act as if there might even be some sarcasm in there. Totally fine. Um, but I think there's some element of that or even just as Shala nicely says, putting your shoulders back, sitting up straight and saying like, yeah, OCD, bring it on. I think there is very much a way to flip how you respond from, oh, I'm crunching over in fear to I'm in a position of power and I'm going to treat this as OCD and I'm going to use this as an exposure on the spot as a chance to get better. Um, over time, um, I, I think you get to a point where, yeah, you don't have to jump up in public spaces and say, yes, OCD, but your mind kind of continues to do that. So I know for me earlier this week, I guess, gosh, it's Monday already last week, um, I had kind of a difficult trigger come up and someone said something to me that was super triggering, brought up a lot of old stuff with me around OCD and um, or for me around OCD. And um, my brain kind of reverted to this tool that I'm telling you about right now. It was like, um, I initially was like, ooh, I'm really scared. And then I heard the thing in my brain of, Oop, sorry, my phone is ringing. Um, mistakes, but um, I I heard the piece in my brain that said, um, yeah, you um, get to be really excited about this potentially, right? And you get to use this as an opportunity to fight your OCD. I got a choice in that moment. And I chose to kind of act as if to act excited and use it as a shot to fight my OCD. And ironically, even just by sticking my shoulders back and saying, bring it on OCD, um, I, I forget even when I stopped worrying about it because it dissipated pretty quickly. Um, okay. Chris, this is a really great question. Um, do you believe OCD is fully curable or will I have to live with it for the rest of my life? So um, I know I mentioned this a little bit earlier, but I believe that OCD currently is something that we navigate throughout life. Um, but that is really part of living this big, beautiful life. It's acknowledging that OCD is a part of something that you continue to navigate, but that doesn't mean that it's something that has to impact you negatively on a daily basis. Um, I'm actually doing an IOCDF conference talk about this with a couple folks coming up. Um, but it's really this, this idea of um, we get... Um, to embrace the fact that we have this diagnosis, we get to acknowledge that we have this diagnosis so it doesn't impact our life on a daily basis. So it doesn't impact us. So for me, yeah, I know I have OCD. I know that I'm going to respond to things maybe in a particular way, but 
rather than um, making that a reason for, for me to get stuck or to get sad. It's even more of a reason for me to respond with an attitude of exposure, for me to respond with an approach of always accepting uncertainty so that I can be at a point where I am now where OCD doesn't impact my life. OCD doesn't call the shots. Um, it moved from OCD being in the driver's seat to OCD literally sitting in the back seat of the bus with me kind of hearing it sometimes, right? So I think that's a possibility too, Chris, and something that's really important. Okay. Um, okay, so this is this is a, a great question that comes up a lot too. So there's this component of of our OCD here, right? I find it hard to relax when I'm with my boyfriend because the thoughts about not loving him anymore appears and it's hard to let them go when I'm with him. I get stuck in my head. Are there any tips? So our OCD is something that's, I know, really challenging for folks, particularly once again, because OCD loves to latch on to the things that are the most significant to us, the things that are the most important to us. What a great opportunity for an exposure. Um, yes, it might be hard to relax, um, but I would encourage you to engage with your clinician and see how you might be able to do, of course, um, exposures outside of that, that situation, maybe imaginal exposures, but even some things that you might be able to think while you're in those situations with your boyfriend, where you might be able to think in your head, yep, okay, I may or may not love him anymore, but I'm going to go back to watching this movie and engaging with him in a way that's meaningful to me. Um, and I think the getting stuck in your headpiece it's where you get to direct yourself back to the moment, right? Um, you can sit there, you can accept the uncertainty, but then you can say, yeah, brain, who knows? Maybe, maybe not. But then you can revert your attention back to what you're doing. And that's kind of like mindfulness, right? Um, we talk about mindfulness practices, meditation, as um, having to do with always bringing yourself back. You're able then to get the choice to bring yourself back to that present moment, even if it's every five seconds. Oh, I'm ruminating. Yeah, maybe, maybe not and coming back to this movie or to this thing that we're doing. Um, okay, so there's another ROC, a couple ROCD questions too. Um, so just, just for folks to know that ROCD, you are not alone in this, and this is something um, that, that can be really challenging for folks, but there, there is so much hope through exposure and response prevention. Um, yeah, so... Um, AK at 820, um, and you can clarify for me further down, I feel like reading and watching this kind of content makes it worse. I become mindful and more aware of it. So I, I'm assuming you're talking about the stream that we're on right now. So, um, oh, I was going to apologize for making it worse, but it's like I hyper apologize and I'm not supposed to. So I'm, I'm not going to do that. But, um, I, you know, I think it can make it worse if you're doing it compulsively, right? I think there's kind of this balance support groups and support Q and A's can be so, so, so significant. I think the times it can make it worse for folks is if you're watching things over and over again, looking for an answer or looking to prove that yours is actually OCD. I think the fact that you're becoming more mindful or aware of it, I wouldn't necessarily say that's making it worse. Um, so when folks say worse, a lot of times they mean more anxious, right? And more anxious doesn't mean worse. Anxiety actually isn't a bad thing. Feelings aren't facts. And ironically, the point of the treatment isn't really to get rid of that anxiety. It's for us to approach it in a different way. It ends up decreasing because we're approaching our thoughts. We're approaching our feelings in a different way. So if your anxiety is raising when you're watching this right now, I'm not worried about that. The thing is, is it making you or, or are you choosing to engage in compulsions as a part of it? If your anxiety is raising and you're not choosing to engage in compulsions, wow, what a great opportunity for an exposure that you're engaging in right now. Okay. Ooh, big one. This is a faith statement. I love this one. Okay, so this is what I do a lot of work with folks around. No CD states that nothing in life is certain. How can I make sense of my faith with this statement? Um, so religious scrupulosity for folks who are watching is a, a subtype of OCD where a lot of times folks become hyper obsessed with an aspect of their faith about whether or not they are engaging in a ritual correctly or praying correctly or whether or not they believe the right thing. Um, and I, ironically, um, I just posted something about this today and the fact that engaging in uncertainty or, or making the choice to sit with uncertainty is actually in many ways a spiritual practice. So here's what I'll say. Faith by definition 
is um, in engaging with something or making the choice to engage with something or, or praying in a way um, that we're connecting with the divine or with the transcendent, which means we're connecting with something that we can't see, hear, feel, touch, experience. Um, and faith in and of itself is about being uncertain, right? And, and sometimes that feels uncomfortable. I'm a minister and sometimes that feels uncomfortable to say. We want to say that we're totally certain about all aspects of faith. But faith is really about maybe not being certain, not being able to touch something tangibly, but believing and making the choice to believe in it anyway. I think just like with OCD, we can have that experience where nothing is certain, but we can still choose to have radical faith Yes, in our religion. Yes, in our treatment. Yes, in ourselves. Yes, in the world. And I think actually those two things fit together in some really, really powerful and beautiful ways. Um, oh, Alexis, this is huge. It's super hard when no one in your life can actually understand. So I appreciate this. I'm trying to get better. And I actually just started my sessions in the past three weeks. So Alexis, that's that's awesome. And that's that's huge. And I'm excited about your your journey. Okay, so I'm gonna I'm gonna scroll down and see if I can hit some questions we haven't hit yet. Um, yeah, I, I see lots of folks talking about being in treatment for a really long time and feeling like they're backtracking, feeling like they're still in a place where they're not quite getting better. Um, and I want to know that I want you to know that I see some sexual orientation OCD conversations here. Um, I want you to know that that's. That's okay. That doesn't mean that you're never going to get to a space where you have that recovery or you have that relief or that life that, that you desire. So I see kind of the one and a half year piece. I'll say when I experienced a relapse, um, it took me a really long time and that is over a year um, to get to a place that I really wanted. And, and for me, um, and it took me a long time to recognize that I was engaging in the exposures but I wasn't engaging in the response to prevention. I actually thought I was, but I wasn't. I was still engaging in rumination in my head. And I, I'm not saying that that means you're doing anything wrong. It's not. It's just that OCD is this really, really, really tough disorder. It really is. But I would encourage you to kind of think through aspects of, are you still trying to figure it out, right? Are you still engaging um, in any type of compulsive behavior? Are you ruminating without noticing it? Um, are you allowing yourself to ruminate without coming back to the present moment? Because for me, that was really it. I was still trying to figure it out. I was still um, trying to sit with the uncertainty in order to get better. And I guess that's another big kind of turning point for me with the OCD is um, when I stopped engaging in the treatment in order to get better, which sounds like it doesn't make a whole lot of sense. That's actually when I started to get better. Right. Um, so as soon as I said, yep, I am willing to feel junky forever. I'm willing to sit with all of this junk forever. That's when I actually started to feel better. And when I started to get better, if that makes sense. So that response prevention piece, um, that, that willingness, that complete and utter, utter willingness to give yourself over to the treatment becomes really, really, really important. Um, I see a lot of folks here, um, chatting and supporting one another. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, so this is this is a really big piece. Um, and I, I want to bring this up because um, OCD, particularly around illnesses, can be really, really tough. Um, so I'm sorry for what you're navigating um, and, and that what if that you're experiencing, the health anxiety piece. I know one of our IOCDF advocates navigates this and, and really struggles with it. I think the best way to cope with the what if, right, is is sometimes by one up one upping the OCD while also having radical faith. It's you know it's you know what, I'm gonna trust this process. Um, but you can also say, yeah, maybe maybe not, right? Um, OCD, I may or may not have cancer. I may or may not, and I know that sounds horrible when I say it, and it makes me feel kind of icky to to say that to you. But I think here's the piece. OCD is currently taking away your life right now. Um, my partner, Ethan, often says OCD creates the reality that we're afraid of. So if we're going through what ifs throughout our entire life because we're worried that cancer is going to take away our life, we actually aren't living that life. If we make the choice to say, yeah, you know what? Maybe, maybe not. Everything I'm afraid of could come true. We're reclaiming our life. 
And if that bad thing was to come true, knowing that and having the trust that you would be able to navigate and that you would be able to figure it out, we can't control that. The thing we can control right now in this moment is saying maybe, maybe not to all of the stuff that we're afraid of for a chance at reclaiming that life we want, desire, and deserve. Um, and that brings me to another really significant component that um, I think somebody asked earlier, what are some of the, the turning points for me that were meaningful? I, I think that's another one of realizing about control, things we can control and things we can't control. So um, for instance, a lot of times we try to control our thoughts, right? We try to control our feelings. We can't. Those are things we simply can't control. But there is one thing we can control. We can control our response to those thoughts, to those feelings. So we can control our ability to lean into the discomfort, to sit with the uncertainty. Now, a lot of times I talk with folks that are like, yeah, no, I'm not willing to do that, but I'm going to try to control my thoughts. That's a really interesting perspective because we're literally flipping it. We're trying to control the thing we can't control, and we're choosing not to control the thing we can, the thing that actually helps us to reclaim our lives from OCD. Um, okay. Yes, Lori. Can't wait for mine to sit on the back of the bus. I'm on week three with the thoughts not leaving. I was diagnosed one year ago. Um, wish I could erase it out of my head. Yeah, I, I've totally been there. And um, and you will get to the point where they're at the back of the bus. And again, just noting, I never thought that I would either. I never thought that that was humanly possible for them to get to the point where they were at the back of a bus. Um, but I think part of it is that where you say, you know, I wish I could erase it out of my head. I think that's where the acceptance piece comes in. It's about saying, you know what, I am willing to have these thoughts forever. I'm willing for them to sit in the front of the bus and I'm going to live my life anyway. And I think that's when you end up scaring the OCD and when it starts to move to the back of the bus. So just letting you know that you can do it. Um, let's see. Yeah, Car Carly, thank you for, um, I'm getting all sorts of calls here. Actually, so I'm in my doctoral program at Vanderbilt, even though I don't live in Nashville and um, they're having alerts going off right now. So I'm getting alert calls. So sorry if I look a little bit distracted. It like keeps coming through on lots and lots platform. So thank you. Um, Carly, so um, I think it makes it worse because in a way it's an exposure and it kind of forces you to think about your OCD thoughts. Like Katie said, it's all about not engaging in those thoughts. It's tricky. Yeah. So I, I mean, I love, I love what you're saying here. Um, <laughs> the exposure piece, right? We're intentionally thinking about those thoughts. Um, and then we're also asking you to not engage in those thoughts. And that can kind of feel like an oxymoron, but that at the same time is what it's all about. And that for a lot of folks is where that act and acceptance and commitment therapy piece comes in about what it means to move towards your values. Um, my big, um, kind of statement is running towards my values where, yep, I'm going to bring out all the stuff. I'm going to sit with the anxiety, but I'm not going to continue to engage rather. I'm going to run towards those things that are the most important to me. Oh, Audrey, thank you for this question. How do you help a loved one who is struggling with OCD, anxiety, and intrusive thoughts when you just don't understand? I think what you're doing here tonight is so incredibly powerful and so moving. The fact that you're just on here tonight and that you're asking questions and that you're being present and you're seeking to get tips and engagement. I also want you to know that there are support groups for family members and loved ones. Um, there's um, feel free to, to reach out to me and I'm, I'm happy to um, try to connect you with that too. But if you look, OCD SoCal has a really, really great one, regardless of where you're located, they meet once a month and do some awesome things. There are awesome, some, also some great books for, for family members. Um, John Hirschfield actually has a really great one. Um, and I think the biggest thing that you can do is not offer reassurance, not offer re accommodation. If know that if your loved one is asking for that or they're getting upset because you're not giving that, you're talking to the OCD, you're not talking to them. So you can continue to resist. But at the same time, offer that love and compassion. I think even if you don't fully understand, you do understand and know that you have a loved one who is struggling. And regardless of the space that they're in, they still love you and they want you to be there on that journey. I think being able to engage with them, asking them how they're feeling without offering reassurance, but also engaging with them in therapy sometimes as is comfortable to ask their therapist how you can help is really significant. So know that even if you don't understand 
on that feeling and on that personal level, you can still offer that support and that compassion that they need. Oh, rumination. Thank you, Jordan. Tips for stopping rumination when it's second nature. Sometimes I don't mean to, but I find myself ruminating. Yeah. So I always say I'm a master ruminator, which is not necessarily a good thing, or it's definitely not a good thing. And um, sometimes, well, well, I guess, especially before treatment, I would find myself ruminating and it will have been like multiple hours and I wouldn't have known that I was ruminating. Um, I, I was always someone who was really, really high functional, high functioning and um, could make it through a whole day of work. Um, I was on faculty. Well, still am. I'm switching jobs, but who could teach all day and could engage with kids and do trauma work and grief work and would get home. And I'd be like, I ruminated for 10 hours of that. Right. Which sounds absurd, but I think that's the case for a lot of us with OCD. We can engage in our life and we can, can ruminate, right? So I think the tip for stopping rumination when it's second nature is first to really make an effort to recognize it. And I think some of that comes from just practicing mindfulness, practicing being present, um, practicing mindful eating or mindful drinking, actually feeling that and processing what that feels like, right? Um, doing your five senses exercises, um, doing um, the square, the triangle breathing exercise, which some of y'all might be familiar with, doing exercises that help you engage in the present so that you're more aware when you drift from the present. Then when you notice you're ruminating, the big piece is to bring yourself back. It's not to yell at yourself and say, oh, I'm ruminating again. It's to compassionately say, oh, I noticed that I'm ruminating. I'm going to make the choice to come back to the present moment. And again, just like meditation, you get the choice to do that each and every time you drift. And even if you have to bring yourself back 200 times, that's a win because you're noticing it and you're bringing yourself back. Okay. Yeah, so this piece comes up for folks a lot to the groinal piece, the groinal response. Um, it, I've tried to sit with it, but my breathing speeds up and I get extremely anxious. So again, that anxiety that you're feeling is not a bad thing. That means that you're engaging in an exposure. I would encourage you to talk to your clinician um, about that and about tools to, to use. But you're engaging essentially by sitting with it in an exposure and response prevention exercise. Because if you're allowing that anxiety to be there um, and you're not doing anything to prevent it from going away, that's really our kind of whole point of treatment, right? It's, it's getting used to that anxiety, being willing to sit with it and knowing that it eventually will go down because it will. So this is such a great opportunity with groinal responses to say it may or may not mean something. Who knows? I'm going to sit with it. And I get that that sounds so hard and it's so anxiety provoking. But by sitting with it and potentially still doing something that's meaningful to you, you really are fighting the OCD and you're going to help it decrease with time. Oh, I see folks having hope. I so appreciate that. Um, let's see. Um, yeah, lots of just anxiety upon waking up for folks. Um, and, and with that, I'm seeing a lot of, a lot of general anxiety components and anxiety upon waking up about how the day is going to go. I've seen a couple pieces with that. Um, and tips with that, again, I, I mean, I try to live a life of uncertainty and a life of exposure while living a life of radical faith. So, um, my favorite thing to do is say, yep. Maybe, maybe not. Um, today could be a hard day. Today could be an easy day. Who knows? But I'm going to have radical faith that whatever today brings, um, I have the skills and tools to handle it. Um, and that's been a really big component for me. Um, let's see. Yeah. So just in terms of resources, I wish there was a forum um, to message with people who suffer from OCD and anxiety. It's hard to post in a public forum and all the OCD groups I've ever joined never helped. Um, and they never talked about OCD and it was frustrating. Yeah. So, um, definitely check out, um, the no CD app if you're not a part of that, because I know that's a really great place where folks are actually able to engage with one another. There's also a great IOCDF resource, um, on health unlocked. That is a full platform just of folks, um, folks being able to talk and message one another another. So those are two that I would definitely encourage you to check out because I do know it can be kind of scary to post in a public forum. Um, 
Just want to note too, um, I've seen the word ego dystonic bounced around um, in a couple spaces tonight. So if folks have seen that word, ego dystonic means that it's something that's actually opposing your values and opposing the person you are. So OCD is actually ego dystonic. The things that we obsess about with OCD oppose or completely go against our values. So that's one of the things that's kind of a hallmark of OCD, but it's also one of the reasons that it's so distressing, right? Because it's opposing the things that are the most dear and the most significant to us. Okay. Ooh. Okay. Do you have any mindfulness recommendations? This is um this is a great a great one. Um, I know I mentioned this just a second ago, but I am a um, huge fan of I guess two two places for recommendations. Um, Shala nicely. Everyday mindfulness for OCD is a a big recommendation. Um, I also love, and there's mindfulness components in this too, Kim Quinlan's new compassion workbook is really, really, really awesome. Those are two of my kind of, kind of first line places to go to. Um, but there's so many mindfulness exercises that you can combine with OCD. So anything that's helping you to engage in being present, I would say specific exercises. My favorite is, um, is doing senses of five things I see, pause, look for five things I see four things I hear, three things I can touch, two things I can smell, one thing I can taste. That's something that's really helpful to me to ground me. I also appreciate all different shapes of breathing where you can imagine um, like the triangle breathing where you can imagine breathing on different sides of the triangle can help me be present as well. Um, there, there are all sorts of different things. I also enjoy body scans for mindfulness. Those are just a few of my favorites, but those two resources I would most definitely check out. So it looks like, I'm sorry, I know I skipped some of the questions because I was trying to, to scroll and, um, and get to as many different things as possible. If I missed questions um, and there were things that you wanted to address, there are no CD live streams all the, all the, all the time. We also have IOCDF live streams all the, all the, all the time. Um, you are also more than welcome to reach out to me. Um, sometimes it does take me a little bit to get back, but um, you are still always welcome to reach out to me at, I'm going to put it in the chat, my email, or... Um, if it allows it to go through, yes. Um, I'm also going to put my Instagram, which I guess I also have in next to my name. But both of those spaces, you are more than welcome um, to reach out to me. And I, I am more than, than happy to try to get back to you with questions. Um, just as we close out tonight, um, I want to say thank you for all of your questions. Also, thank you for the advocacy that so many of you are engaging in. Just being on here, um, supporting one another, asking questions, answering questions, you're advocating. Um, you are supporting one another. You are offering hope that somebody's not alone. And that's a huge, 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 huge difference. Um, I also want to close out one more time by, by saying, please follow um, my race on Saturday, 50 Ultras in 50 States for OCD, the South Carolina race. Um, again, fundraising to make sure everyone can afford evidence-based treatment for OCD. Um, and just want to say again, one of the reasons that's so important to me is... I was not always in a space where I could talk about my OCD. Um, I was not always in a space where I could advocate. I was very, very ashamed for a long time. Um, navigated OCD since I was eight. Didn't get treatment until my 20s. Then experienced a relapse. Thought I would never get better. Hit it through my ministry process, through my ordination process. And really evidence-based treatment saved my life. Um, and I want to make sure that everyone has that opportunity to reclaim the beautiful life that they both desire and deserve. So for me, that's why I've run. I think it's all about having the opportunity to sit with that discomfort and that uncertainty as we run towards our values, which is kind of my big, my big motto. It's running towards our values, which for me actually means running ultra marathons. For some people, that means moving towards the things that are the most important to them, whether that has to do with family um, or faith, right? Or art or anything meaningful, right? And that's the goal is for each and every one of you to be able to reclaim that beautiful life that you both desire and deserve. So in closing out tonight, 
Um, oh, okay. Sorry. I have one more question here and um, I'm, I'm happy to go a minute over because I started a minute late. Um, my brain um, constantly bringing up memories or things from the past um, that are proof that my fear is real. Um, is this an OCD symptom? Yeah, no, totally an, an OCD symptom. And if you're saying anything about trying to prove that something is real, is this real? What, what if this is real? How could I possibly prove that this is or this isn't real? Definitely this OCD component proof is a really big word with that. So just wanted you to know that because um, without offering too much reassurance, because this was a big component for me. So just in closing out, I want to tell everyone um, that I encourage you to lean into the discomfort, to sit with the uncertainty, to run towards your values, to claim all of those things that are really important to you. And please, please, please remember um, that you can risk all of the bad, scary, icky stuff for a chance at that beautiful life that you both desire and deserve um, and a chance at that beautiful life that you can and that you will claim. So thank you all so much for being here tonight. And um, I hope to chat with you on Instagram or via email or on another stream. Um, but regardless, just glad to be on the journey together. So good night, y'all. Thanks so much.